Monday morning at 6 a.m. in the hospitality tent. Come join us for that. Hi, GV Kids. We've had so much fun on Wednesday nights. Remember, check-in is at 6.30, and I'm so excited to see you. Our intercessory prayer team would be honored and humbled to pray for and with you. Please text us at 615-282-7449 or email us at prayer at globalvisionbc.com. We claim Matthew 7, 7 over your prayer request right now, and we look forward to praying with you. Hey, man, listen up. So April 4th and 18th, we'll meet in the hospitality tent at 6 p.m. And don't forget, we host Family Night at 5 p.m. April 6th this month. So don't miss out. I'll see you guys there. Attention, ladies. Secret Place will be meeting April 9th at 6 o'clock p.m. underneath the tent for a potluck and fellowship with Pastor Ty. And then we will meet again April 25th through the 28th for the Encounter the Glory Conference. Hallelujah. It's going to be an amazing time. We have a lineup of women of God who are going to bring the word. And I am in expectation that we will leave differently than when we came in. So join us as we encounter his glory. Is we have a high priest named Jesus that is interceding for us night and day because the accuser of the brethren right now is in the courts of heaven making accusations against you but there's a high priest named Jesus that is that paid it all for you that is interceding for you and he is praying that your faith would not fail but your faith only increases when your fear of the Lord only increases in the mighty name of Jesus we declare these dry bones to come alive for Lazarus to come out of the tomb right now in the mighty name of Jesus. So any hindering spirits and any monitoring spirits in the mighty name of Jesus, I bind and break you by the death, the blood, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are not welcome here. We evict the enemy out of our homes, out of our marriages. Take down my cross. Walked it out. Jesus, I know you're with me. Jesus, I know you're strengthening me. I know that this is because in a couple some other young lady is going to need me to be fortified in this area of my life. I will not abandon the cross. I'm picking it up and I'm going all the way with Jesus. Hey! Satan, you cannot have me. You see, you're under my feet. That means every time I take a step, I'm stepping on your head because you can't have me. I belong to the blood. log out of your eye yet? Good. Because if you're ages 16 to 25, you need to join the Global Vision Young Adults on April 13th at 6 p.m. It's going to be a night of worship and fellowship. So be there or be square. No, I'm just kidding, but I hope to see you there. That's all the announcements we have for the month of April. Check out this movie trailer. Has anybody seen my log? God is commissioning you to do what he called you to do. It is time for you to suit up and boot up and step into your calling because this is your kingdom calling right now. You don't have time to sit around with your hands. Jesus is coming again. Let your life so therefore shine before men. There's a reason why you got this far because you're going all the way into the promise of what God has for you. I see your head, 
I see a sign, not in the grave, you walked out alive. The world remembers the day that death died.
opportunity to go to Israel this past week. Most everybody knows that. Amen. 
forever marked is an understatement, but I want to share something with you this morning. We were really doing things on the fly, like really super fast. Um, we had our own personal tour guide. It was just the three of us. He was amazing. Um, it was such an honor to be taught by him. But I think he was also amazed that um, we learned so quick. Or, or like, you know, my husband would, would quote the Bible verse to every place that we went in Israel. Amen. And so um, we get to uh, the the palace, Herod's palace. And and we're standing there and he's really, he's just giving us stuff on the fly. And, and you look down and there's this, there's this beautiful tree right there in that place. And he begins to talk about, you know, this is more than likely the place where they convicted him, where Barabbas and Jesus was. And, and we were doing things so fast and they went to walk away and I don't know, something inside of me stopped and I, I stopped right there and I, I looked over and I couldn't imagine the moment that Jesus stood before his own people and they yelled, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And I began to be overwhelmed just standing right there. It was almost like I was in that moment and I was like an outsider and I was looking in. And in that moment, I understood the love of the Father. Because listen, we're thankful that it's an empty tomb. I don't know about you, I'm thankful that there's an empty tomb, amen. And our little rocks in Mount Juliet, Tennessee do not do justice how big this stone really was that rolled away. But I found myself even more thankful for the obedience of the Lord Jesus. You know, sometimes we can go through life and, and we can get to days like this and we celebrate resurrection and we should, amen, because we have resurrection power. But you don't get resurrection power without crucifixion. You don't get resurrection power without obedience. You see, likewise, as Jesus did, we are to die to self every day. The Bible says to crucify your flesh daily and follow after him. And I looked over that, that place where we were standing and I couldn't help but think, Lord, have I really crucified my life to you? Have I really sacrificed it all for the one who set me free? So I don't know where you are today in your walk with the Lord, but can I remind you today that it's the blood of Jesus that sets you free. It's the blood of Jesus that makes you whole. It's the obedience of the cross. He counted it joy, the book of Hebrews says. He counted it joy to endure the cross for us. And so today we can rejoice that hell lost its keys. We can rejoice that the de demons have been defeated, that the devil has been evicted. And if that doesn't give you a reason to praise, I don't know if you have one. But more than that today, may we be a people that go before the throne room of heaven and say, oh, but Lord, we thank you for the blood. We're thankful for the tomb, but oh God, we're thankful for the blood. We're we're thankful for your obedience to the cross, oh God. Lord, we are thankful that you made a way when there seemed to be no way, oh God. Lord, we're thankful that you have been given all power and glory and honor and dominion. It belongs to you. All the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We bring you the highest praise. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The anointed one. You're a high priest, the rose of Sharon and the lily of 
prophet, he's the anointed one. Sing out his name in this place this morning. Oh Lord, we exalt your name. We exalt your name. You will be exalted above the nations, oh God. Savior of the world. He's Yeshua HaMashiach. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us.
praises be to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Come on, King of Glory, come and fill this place. King of Glory, come fill this place. Today we are honored to be in this house. We thank you for the evidence of your presence moving amongst us. Lord, we don't get in a hurry. We don't rush. We just wait upon you, Lord. We pray that you would indeed manifest your power, your glory in our midst. Lord, we don't really do things for extra special services because the church of the living God should always have extra special services and invite the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, you're alive every weekend, every day. Every day you're alive. And because you live, we live, we have life, life more abundantly, not life more redundantly, not boring, not mundane, not lukewarm, not half-hearted, life abundantly. Today, fill people with abundant life, abundant hope, abundant peace, abundant joy, abundant fulfillment because of the gospel. So Lord, we worship you, we adore you, we love you, and we can only say that because you first loved us. And convict the people in-house and online, those that will watch later, and even throughout the weak American church, convict the people that proclaim with their mouth that they love you, but their actions prove otherwise. Weed out the fakes in the American church. We ain't got time to mess around, waste our time with lukewarm fake people that are nothing but hypocrites. Lord Jesus, you didn't patty cake and serve those people you rebuked the Pharisees and told them to get right with God but you discipled and fellowship with those that wanted to go deeper wanted to learn more wanted to know more wanted to do more wanted to be more for the cause of the kingdom the gospel's sake so father today 
convict us. Continue to move in this house. Continue to move online. Move in all of our hubs. And thank you for the new hubs that even launched this week. To God be the glory. Thank you for that. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We celebrate you, Lord Jesus. We honor you, Lord Jesus. We, we welcome you into this house. And if we ever get pride and stuffy and we forget to welcome you, step in and take over even when we don't welcome you, Lord. Put us on our face in the glory of God. This is your house. Do with it what you will. In the mighty name of Jesus. And the church shouted out. Take about 10 seconds and just praise the Lord in this house on Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. He's alive. He is alive. Yes. Well, glory to the Lamb of God. Takes away the sin of the world. You glad to be here? Shout hallelujah. Shout amen. Shout glory to God. Woo, man, I'm so full right now. What a trip. No, I'm not going to go into all of it and download it all today. It'll take me months to unpackage it, but that's all right. We're going to unpackage it. And I tell you what, a trip to Israel. And it was, it was so anointed and so appointed because, you know, and I'm, I'm glad for everybody that gets to go and they get their 8 and 10 and 12 and 14 day trips. But we literally, in a few days, got the back tour, the back lot. We got to see things that most people will never see a day in their life. Here thing, we, we had a, a personal, not only was he a Bible theologian, a Christian par excellence Bible theologian, but also a Jewish historian, a Ukrainian Jew. And I'm telling you, the things that he was able to open our hearts and minds to, the things that we were able to see and experience, and the off-limits places that we were able to go and get limits to was absolutely extraordinary and life-changing. But I want to say something before we prepare our hearts for the offering. People hear that sometimes. Because I used to hear that. And I'm like, man, my wife and I want to go to Israel so bad we can't see straight. Yada, yada. You know, is it an expensive trip? Is it, is it safe? By the way, the news media has lied to you. It's the safest place on planet Earth right now. They've lied, 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 lied. But I don't have time to get into that. But people are like, oh, man, I would love to be able to, to go there and, and walk where Jesus walked. Two things about that. Number one, it's extraordinary if you ever get the chance. Listen, if Jesus Terry will lead tours, we'll take people back because if you think it's a one and done for me, you absolutely not. Absolutely not. But let me tell you, let me encourage you with something. Let me tell you what we're learning here at our church. You may never hop on a jumbo jet and go walk where Jesus walked. But the glory of God is going to so do something in this church that your whole life is going to be radically convicted, challenged, changed, and rearranged, and you're going to learn to walk right here like Jesus walked, whether you ever go to Jerusalem or not. So it's, it's a sight to behold. It is many sights to behold. It is fantabulous. We'll talk a little bit about it in the message today. But many of you know the enemy's already been fighting, which shows me that God's on the throne and God's doing something. Don't let the news media bother you this morning. We've had a couple of them in and out, I think, after our offering during the continued worship. Before I preach, I have to give them some little statement or, or whatever. But uh, I, I just knew. I got up this morning. Couldn't, couldn't sleep, you know, because your, your flights have you all off, you know. And so I'm, like, way ahead of you guys, like, right now. I'm, like, nine, ten hours ahead. And so I, I woke up super early, and I, I told my wife, I said, yeah, I got a lot to do. I'm going to get ready this morning with the message and all that. So I'm, I'm going to go over to the church early, and I'm glad I did. So I came over early, and I'm like, why is Chandler Road blocked with the police? What did I do? I've been in Israel. I haven't said anything. And then I, I looked down there, and there's fire trucks, and, and there's all type of city police and county police. And I'm like, it looks like a, a car is turned over by the mailbox. You know, what's going on? And so I got closer, and of course, you've seen, you know, the, the footage and the pictures. And we have the whole thing on uh, security camera video, which I've not even seen yet. But uh, he probably wasn't uh, expecting us to have that. But he'll be getting in quite a, a deal of trouble extensively. And so he takes a trailer, he, he, he scotches the wheels, right? He's got his hazard lights on at 5.58 in the morning. I'm like, wow, he's the most polite crook I've ever met in my whole life. I've never met, like, you know, polite Satanists and stuff. And so he, like, unhooks the trailer, 
and douses it with gasoline, with fuel. And then there were probably, if you saw the picture, it, probably 200 Bibles. I don't know where he got them, but he had, he had to buy them somewhere, right? 200 Bibles on a trailer, and he blocked uh, the, the Chandler Old Lebanon exit, thinking that people weren't going to be able to get into church, I suppose, and just set the whole thing. Just, just goes up in flames, right? All these Bibles. Thank God we had a lady that was here in the, in the parking lot uh, that, had, that had drove in, and she saw it kind of when it transpired. It would have you know, melted the wires and all of that. And so I'm walking out, and I'm like, You've got to be kidding me. How many churches in America have a trailer full of Bibles get burned to block the parking lot? So we were telling the, hey amen. So we were telling the, uh, the detectives and stuff, they, they, they brought like FBI in the whole deal. So I, I, was, I was like, hey, y'all going to leave the trailer here? I said, we're going to roll it up here and I'm going to start passing out pages of the Bibles so that people can start praying for our church, give everybody a charred piece, you know? And they're like, no, 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 no. They said, we've now turned this over, not just to local authorities. They said, this is a hate crime. It's a hate crime against the church. And so they got the FBI involved. And so they, they wouldn't have us, let us have any of the, the shards and the pieces and all that kind of stuff. But that's okay. Because look, at the end of the day, stuff like that. Miles Rutherford called me this morning. Your friend of mine in Atlanta, Miles called me. He said, look, man, I know you're the kind of guy that this kind of stuff doesn't dampen you. It, it fires you up as much as that trailer was fired up. I said, yeah. And he said, let me tell you something. He said, he gave me a voicemail. He said, let me give you a word. He said, I believe what this is going to do for your church. He said, it's going to make you like Elizabeth. The babe's about to leap in your womb because you're about to give birth to something brand new in the kingdom, in the spirit. So look, that kind of stuff doesn't bother me one bit. Pastors would get discouraged and, you know, the average church would be like, oh my goodness, they're coming against us. And I'm like, thank God they are. Thank God they are. If you think that Christianity is not under attack more than ever before in the United States of America, you have not been paying attention. You need to get your head out of the sand. Quit being lukewarm. Quit being so passive aggressive and man be pamby and, and you know spiritually sissified. Okay, I'm telling you, they're attacking churches in America. They're attacking. Them. Can I remind you? For evangelical believers and for Catholics, for that matter, this is the most important day historically and biblically that you can imagine and now joe biden makes it trans visibility awareness day if you think for any second that that christianity is not under an assault and under an attack you are not paying attention friends wake up to the reality of what it, the beast system is here they hate those that tell the truth. Stop all this. Well, you know, it's going to get bad in 50 years. No, 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 no. It's been bad for 50 years. It's the worst it's ever been. Stop playing games with God. I ain't even got to the preaching yet, but I'm telling you, stuff is happening. Jesus is coming again, folks. All these Christians, and listen, I've seen it all over the, the, the GV online page too, all right? So let me politely rebuke you. I'm sick of hearing all these people say, well, you know, it, it, it's finished, it's done. What's, what's all the nonsense with these red cows? Let me tell you something. Yes, Jesus finished the work of the cross. Yes, he is alive. Yes, we're not living underneath a sacrificial system. But the Orthodox Jews still have to do what the Bible says to fulfill biblical prophecy. So we're going over there during our Passover week, right? Which we've relegated to a bunch of eggs and bunnies in the United States. But I found out it's not their Passover week. Their Passover week's next month. They got a different calendar. They got a better calendar than we do. Our calendar's all jacked up. But it's next month. And everybody's like, well, you know, I, I hear they're going to kill the red cows. These bunch of religious zealots. Let me tell you something. Those bunch of religious zealots are the reason you and I have been even grafted in to understand the truth of the gospel. 
And you may be offended by animal sacrifice and you may be offended by a big old altar that's going to be sitting on the Mount of Olives looking straight at the temple. That stuff may offend you. But as Jesus said, these things must come to pass. So look, here's why I'm telling you that. What a way to take an offering. I'm telling you that because you better wake up. Because some of y'all think, well, you know, my family's got 10 more years, 15 more years. Do you realize the pastor, Pastor Israel, who I was with in Israel, he said, look, we understand biblically that, that we don't, we're not in celebration of that. That's not our salvation. But, but the unsaved Jewish nation that eventually will be saved because a nation will be born again in a day. They'll look upon him whom they appear. God's not done with the nation of Israel. He says, you have to understand, Pastor Locke, that we are right this very moment. He said, right this very moment, everything that needs to be fulfilled for a temple, for the sacrificial system, for the priest, for all of that. He said, all of it could be done from this moment in the next year, completely finalized. And you want to sit around with your thumb in your nose and act like it's no big deal and Jesus is going to come in 50, 60, 80, 90, 100 years from now. We are watching the word of God be fulfilled before our very eyes, ladies and gentlemen, before our very eyes, it's happening. And the church sitting around twiddling his thumbs. You better start winning people to Christ. He that winneth souls is wise. You better start telling your family and friends about Jesus Christ. You better start telling people about the gospel. You don't have nearly as much time as you think you do. I know that sounds offensive and that sounds abrasive, but get over it. The calendar days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It's happening. We stand up on Herod's temple and look one way, go the next day over to the Mount of Olives and look the other way, and there's that big old golden dome of the rock. It's a monstrosity. Huge. The most recognized Middle Eastern building, really probably one of the most recognized structures on the planet outside the Taj Mahal. And I look at that, and you look at the amount of Muslims and Islamic influence all over the Temple Mount. Okay, there's been two temples there. You understand that? And we look at that, and people are like, well, you know, let's just let's let's just tell the Jewish nation to, you know, just go across the Kidron Valley, go go somewhere else, just go set up your little tabernacle of Moses. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I talk with people that know the Bible more than I'll ever imagine. They forgot more Bible than Greg Locke will ever know or preach a day in his life. And I said, let me tell you what I told my church. And I said, here's my suspicions. They said, what you told your church is right, keep telling them. Ain't no suspicion, it's the facts. Whole world has a meltdown. I, we did it when Israel went to war, which is a media-infused lie. I stand a thousand percent for the nation of Israel. A thousand percent for the nation of Israel. And if you don't, you're in the wrong church. But I said it that day, and, the, and the, the world went nuts. I'm surprised they ain't burned down more than just 200 Bibles in our driveway trying to keep people from getting to church on Resurrection Sunday. But I said it then, and I believe it now. Those, those Bible scholar Jews and even those Messianic Jews, saved Jews, said, look, we're telling you right now, the Dome of the Rock will be brought to rubble. It will be brought to the ground. The third temple will be built on that spot. And yes, it will usher in the Antichrist, but you better know something. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. And there are things that have to happen for prophecy to be fulfilled. And we got to quit being so timid. Quit being so timid. I'll say one more thing. Stop letting people shame you especially on twitter x whatever they call it they named it right don't you x-rated idiots here's what they say oh y'all a bunch of zionists that they're not even real jews hadn't you read up you better stop that right this second i'll never tolerate that another day in this church another second in this church i'll never tolerate it the jewish nation are the chosen people of God a million percent and when a church don't support Israel you better know something God won't support the work of that church when a nation doesn't support Israel that's why the UN better figure out what they're doing in this Joe Biden godless 
Administration better figure it out real quick. Better figure it out real quick. Listen, we are no longer voting for Republicans and Democrats. We are voting for freedom and tyranny. That is it. So stop all this. Well, they're not real Jew. They're as Jew as Jew can get. I've been there. I've walked it. I've smelled it. I've tasted it. I've seen it. I've experienced it. And it's changed me. It's changed me. And it ought to change you. It ought to stir you. Pay attention to what's happening. Everybody online wanting to fuss about it. I don't think, I don't care what you think. If you think it's right, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen whether you like it or not, Facebook friends. The red heifer sacrifice is going to happen. It is going to happen. Whether you like it or not, Numbers 19 will be fulfilled in the life of Israel. Jerusalem is the city of God. Always has been, always will be. And I've never, ever, 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 ever understood the Bible as much as I do now. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. I think it ought to be mandatory for every gospel preacher to go to Israel so they can figure out what they're talking about. I'm telling you, I am shocked at some of the nonsense I've heard in messages that have nothing to do with biblical Christianity. Shocked. By some of the sermons I've heard where people sit there. DR knows we've been in the meetings. Preach, preach, amen. They are amen in nonsense that Jesus never said, never meant. And I'm telling you, something about this week marked us forever. And it wasn't just a cute little tour, it was the fact that I got to minister in Israel in the only church in Ashdod. 255,000 people. They're the only. No, 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 no. Not one of a few. They are the only. He is the, the pastor to the whole region. And the Orthodox Jews and the rabbis hate him. He's been in lawsuits like we have, but much, much longer. They try to stop him from getting buildings. Now, they got about 300 people. That is a mega church in Israel. A mega church. There is not a church within miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of this man of God. All different ages. And man, we preached the other night and how the glory of God fell out. Of course, I'm preaching in English and they're speaking in Hebrew. And it was beautiful. So on the way home, he's like, look, I have such an appreciation for you and your church and your ministry. He watched the movie, come on, in Jesus' name. And he's like, I want to know when you can come back, bring people with you and do a deliverance seminar in Ashdod and talk to our people about freedom. I said, yes, sir, you signed me up. They're hungry for the gospel. They're hungry for the truth of God's word. And so I know that's a long way around the barn, but I'm telling you, it's a life-marking experience. I'll never be the same. Never be the same. Never be the same. Don't want to be the same. Okay? It's given me a new level of boldness, a new level of anointing, just being there, seeing it from my own eyes, letting the Bible come to life. And he's like, what about this, this, this? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and all of a sudden, I'm like, like she said, I'm quoting it, quoting it, quoting it. She's quoting it. And he's like, wow, you learn quickly. He's like, I'm not used to, you know, dealing with people that know the Bible so well. I said, well, I've read it 16 times in the last couple of months. I ought to know a little bit of it. <laughs> and it's just amazing. Just come, pop, 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 pop. We're like in underground tunnels under Jerusalem. I'm like, this is crazy. And we get off the plane, we're driving down the road, and he stops, he's like, hey, hey, he's like, look over there. It's like a, a rock in the middle of a field. He's like, Samson was born there. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Just crazy stuff like that. So we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll get his plane load. We're going to go over there and turn the Israel upside down. Amen. <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk more about it on maybe some Wednesdays and give you some theological understanding of some things that I got. Now today I want to be faithful in our giving online globalvisionbc.com slash G-I-V-E give. Our hubs, everybody online just begin to give. Everybody in house, I want our ushers to begin to come. I just want you to put the buckets down here on the steps of the altar today if you would please. And I just want you all over the room we're going to give today. If you make it a check just make it to Global Vision, GV, whatever. And uh, today our offering, now look on, on big days like this the average pastor would be like, oh yeah, you know our, our church and the average church, we, we, we need to have a great offering. We got a lot of bills to pay. Look, we always have a lot of bills to pay. We're a large ministry. We have a lot going on. But today, every nickel of this offering is going to be given away. And so on one of our biggest days, biggest evangelical holiday, we're going to give the whole thing away. We're going to bless our missionaries. Some of them are struggling right now. And so we're going to pay a number of them in advance for the next five or six months so they can have everything that they need. And they're hurting. If you think America's hurting, when America hurts, know this, that the economy of the world's hurting. And we have missionaries.
marriage right now that can barely buy groceries, barely drive a car because of the gas prices. And so we want to bless them. So everything we bring in today in house and online is going to go in completely a thousand percent and then more some added to it, given away to our missionaries and bless those families and those men and women of God uh, in the States and around the world. And so we want to honor them. We want to bless them. So right now, just all over the room, just stand to your feet. We're going to continue to worship. And as we worship, give as a portion and as a part of your worship. And may the peace of the Lord come upon you today. May the blessings and prosperity of the Lord come upon you today. But in this room and online all over, let's right now just begin to give freely, cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. He'll take it from a grouch, but God loves a cheerful giver. And we want to be faithful in his stewardship with his resources today as we give to our missionaries and as we bless them. And as we've done so many things for Israel, now we know an action physical place where the money is going to be used. It's not just an organization that's helping. I thank God for those, but boots on the ground, mass evangelism, local church. We're going to begin to sponsor Pastor Israel and his church and that congregation, and it's going to be a beautiful thing. So if you are glad that you have the privilege to partner with God today, give him some praise and shout hallelujah in this house. So let's worship. Come forward, do your giving online, do your giving, and I know God's going to bless as we bless many women of God all over the world with 100% of this offering. To God be the glory.
Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord in this house today. He's worthy of it. You may be seated all over the house. You can return to your seats. Thank you for being here. On any weekend, but especially such an extraordinary time of celebration. I want to take our text in the book of Philippians chapter 3 today. We're going to continue to talk about the glory of God. We're just going to divert from our Old Testament verse-by-verse series on the glory of God and what the glory of God produces in our life and jump into the New Testament so we can see what the glory of the resurrection does in our life. We want to, we want to celebrate that today. We want to talk about it. So I want you to have your Bibles. I want you to have your journals and envelopes or whatever you have available to write some things down. A short pencil is better than a long memory. And some of us have been blessed and gifted with a good memory, but it'll go away one day. Jot some things down in the Word of the Lord. If I learned anything this week, it's to pay attention to details when something is said in the Bible. Because every word of God is for our learning and for our admonition. There is not one word in the Bible, not even an A, an, or a the, that is misdirected or misplaced. It's important. It is the word of the Lord, and we should treat it with reverence as such. Amen, church? We should respect the Bible, read the Bible, love the Bible, devour the Bible, eat the Bible, read the Word of God, memorize the Word of God, live within the context of the Word of God every day of our life. And so today I, I do want to deal somewhat with the, the glory of the resurrection because indeed there is an empty tomb. And if there's one thing I can say about going to Jerusalem, it's the simple fact that Jesus is alive. It is a historical fact that Jesus Christ is alive. Now, we prayed a moment ago, and so I'm, I'm already in. So if you're time and preachers, hit it right now, because I'm about to go in high gear. So when you go to Jerusalem, what you'll find out is that people all over that place believe indeed that Jesus is alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that he was seen of more than 500 people at once. Now, let that simmer down and soak in to the, to the soil of your soul for just a moment. How many of you, and you know, we don't have to necessarily brag about this, but we know that we're a church where broken people find new meaning to life. How many of you ever been to court for a serious situation? Put your hand high in the air. All right, that's most of our crowd, amen, mine included. Let me tell you something about court. In our judicial system in the United States of America, it only takes one witness to put you under the jail or to set you free for the rest of your life. You mean to tell me that 500 credible people went on record and said, we saw Jesus Christ of Nazareth after he got out of the grave, and you're going to tell me that those 500 doctors, prostitutes, preachers, lawyers, Pharisees, people from every walk of life, every size, every shape, every nationality you can imagine, are you telling me all those people lied? Let me tell you something. 500 witnesses? would stand up in any court on the planet, ladies and gentlemen. The most significantly, historically accurate fact is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is just as, if not more so, significant this morning in this tent outside of Nashville, Tennessee, as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus got up out of the grave and the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. It was rolled away so we could look in and know the tomb is empty so our hearts can be filled with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's alive. He walks amongst us. He is alive. Romans chapter 2 says that Jesus Christ was powerfully declared to be the Son of God, comma, by the resurrection of the dead. You see, there's a lot of leaders of a lot of institutions, denominations, sects, cultures, cults, groups, organizations, and institutions but there is only one group of people on the planet who has a leader that died and is no longer dead. You better know something. The prophets of old lived and died and they're dead. Mary Baker Patterson Glover and all points West Steady of the Christian science movement, which isn't Christian or scientific, she died and she's still dead. 
Little known fact. She was buried with a telephone. Now, it'd be an old timey one of them rotary deal. She was buried with a telephone. Ain't nobody ever called it, and if they did, it would never get answered because she's still dead. Buddha's dead. Confucius and the rest of that confused crowd, dead. Muhammad, dead. Absolutely, positively, without a doubt. Hitler, dead. Napoleon, dead. George Washington, dead. Stalin, dead. All of them dead. Abraham Lincoln, dead. Great preachers of the past, dead. Jesus is not dead. He is accurately, biblically, prophetically, historically, and in every other way alive this very moment. It's the one doctrine that separates biblical New Testament Christianity from every other doctrine and every other group on the planet. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty conqueror or his foes. He arose victorious over the vast domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is alive this morning, but you better know this. When you wake up tomorrow, he'll still be alive. When you get up Thursday, he'll still be alive. When you're having a bad day, he'll still be alive. When you're broke as a joke and considering a diamond dangle both legs, he's still alive. When Israel's at war, he's still alive. When Ukraine's at war, he's still alive. If Biden's in the White House, He's still alive, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is alive. And because he lives, I can live and face tomorrow. I refuse to be defeated. I refuse to not live in peace. I refuse to not live in victory. Not going to walk around with a poochy mouth disease full of a spirit of anxiety and depression and heaviness. Oh, no. He is alive. And because he's alive, we have life more abundantly. The American church is content with boring worship. Lukewarm approach to the things of God. It's why we're such a magnet for the media. Because we're an anomaly. And I like it. I don't want to fit in with the average church. This is not the church you grew up in or grandmama's church or the church down the road or denomination this or denomination that. I find it interesting that in Israel, the pastor said, look, I know you're going to preach the Bible, so I don't really have to tell you what to say or what not to say. He said, but I would just suggest you don't talk about denominations because our people don't know what that means. (laughs) Woo! Holy smokes, Brother DR, wouldn't we have revival in America if we didn't know what denomination meant? These people just show up and serve God at the expense of their own livelihoods and sometimes their own life. And so we want to talk about the Apostle Paul for just a moment. But I'll tell you one thing. You start walking roads to Damascus, you'll start seeing the Bible different. You start sitting down at a picnic table, and this guy opens up his phone and says, read this story right here. And I read the story, and he's like, hey, do you realize that where you're reading this story is where this happened? And I'm like, whoo, I'm about to have a conniption. We're, we're in synagogues, which, by the way, are as big as this platform. 150 people crammed into them. They, we think they're big old mega churches. No, no, no. When them demons started getting stirred up, all that religious crowd started getting nervous. I mean, they were close. I mean, 100, 150 people crammed into a room like sardines in a can. Jesus starts talking about the power and the authority of the word of God, and a demon starts manifesting right in the synagogue. And I said, you mean to tell me we're in one of those synagogues? He said, right now. I was like, whoo, help me, Holy Spirit. To drive by certain places. To go to a place called Magdala. Where what we're finding out now is not where Mary Magdalene is from. It's the town that was named after her. Because she was a pretty influential and affluent individual. That's a message for another time. Man, I found out some stuff that blow my mind. I'm like, they taught me wrong in seminary. I'm thinking to myself, I don't think these Bible teachers ever been to Israel because what they said is total opposite what's right before my very eyes. Biblically, accurately, archaeologically, I'm looking at it. That ain't what they told me because what they told me didn't fit the narrative of the denominational hierarchy. 
You see, you cannot ever be the same. I'll get to the text. This part of it. You can't ever be the same when you stand on the Mount of Olives. And you see, and I told my wife, I said, you know what amazes me? This is the most valuable fought over piece of real estate on the planet. And it's tiny, little bitty, insignificant dot on the map. Tiny. Whole town looks the same way. Old Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, limestone everywhere. And listen, they don't have, other than what happened in Gaza, the media is trying to tell you that there's all kind of stuff going on. Listen, he said, I couldn't tell you the last time we ever had a kidnapping. Kids walking around at midnight by themselves in the streets. Women jogging. Middle of the night, by themselves. He said, we don't have stabbings. We don't have kidnappings. We don't have any of that. They stopped. They put a wall up. We better figure that out. They put a wall up, I said, and stopped all the terrorists from coming over and blowing up buses. And he said, man, it's, it's just so safe. And I, I got up one morning just by my, I couldn't sleep. I, just got, I said, hey, baby. I said, uh, I'm going to leave the hotel. I'm going to walk to Old Drew. I'm going to go to the wall. I went down to the waiting wall all by myself. It's 630 in the morning. Then people down there, ah! they're serious about it. They're down there crying for a Messiah that's already showed up and some of you know he showed up and you ain't cried after him in years. Them Jews down there got sideburns make Elvis look silly. Wearing them hat, walking around. People say, well, you know, y'all reading too much Bible. I ain't never seen people walk around town reading so much Bible. Here you go, about everybody reading this. All of those Hebrew, we're walking around with Bibles in their hand. It's crazy. And people are like, well, you know, we just, that's just not our culture. No, you see, our, our culture is, let's just be casual. Let's read a Bible when it makes us feel good. Now we'll lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And the whole world giving people a hard time for not believing in the Messiah when one day they will believe in the Messiah. But let me tell you something. They believe in what they believe more than we actually believe in a historical Messiah. Because they live there, they know the tomb is empty. And every apostle died saying the tomb is in. How many people you know would die for a lie? I ain't never met one. If I think it's a lie, I'd be like, well, you know, we can fight for it so I can preserve the history, but I ain't dying for it. Every one of them died to say Jesus is alive. Kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. All through the crusades, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. All through all of these years of the Spanish Inquisition, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. There's not one doctrine on the planet that more people have died for than that of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you're going to tell me that he's still rotting somewhere in a tomb? And we're like, well, you know, church, you know, once a year is good for me. Let me tell you once a year, people, something. You see, I'm not one of these guys trying to build a crowd. I'm trying to build a church for the body of Christ. If you show up to keep your mama off your back around Christmas and Easter, you're a creaster and you ought to get your heart right with God. I don't care if you ever come back or not. I'm not here to make you like me. I'm here to let you fall in love with Jesus. Go to church one time a year. Talk about how much you love God. These people go to a wall every day. They're rocking back and forth at 4 o'clock in the morning. 4 o'clock in the morning. Chanting stuff I don't even understand. Men on one side, women on the other. They don't even let them women over in that synagogue, which, by the way, makes so much historical proof for why Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach or to even speak in church. It was their culture. It wasn't a doctrine keeping women from being able to preach. I'm telling you, if you go there, you'll find out that there were so many women that followed Jesus. His ministry wouldn't have even been successful without prophetic women around him. There ain't a man one in the Bible but Joseph of Arimathea that gave Jesus a tomb. Ain't a man one in the Bible ever gave Jesus money that we know about. But I can show you a whole list of women that gave him money so he could preach. But to see it and see that big gaudy dome of the rock and know in my heart you coming down and have absolutely no qualms in offending people saying that. I don't care. They're going to blow it up. You say they're, they're going to incite the rage of Muslims. Please don't be stupid. They already hate us. 
They'd already slice your throat if they had the prime opportunity. Stop all this sympathy. Stop it. Now, you know, there's millions of Arabs being saved. There are Arabs that are not Islamic. So the news says, oh, you hate Muslims because you're prejudiced against Arabs. That's stupid. Arabs were in Acts chapter number two. Before Islam corrupted them with their perversity. We're not against Arabs. We're against a false religious system that wants to keep people in bondage and that says death to Israel, death to America, and death to everyone that doesn't believe the way that we believe. You see, we live in a nation where if you don't like a Bible, apparently you can show up and burn 200 of them before us in church. Right? Now, there's ramifications for stuff like that. But when you go over there and you start realizing, wow, it's about to go down. It's about to happen. And I told my wife, I said, look at here, baby. And I mean, this is like right there on you, right? I was like, look at that hill. Mount of Olives. Gethsemane right at the bottom of it. I said, you, you see this right here? I said, Jesus said that he would place his foot on the Mount of Olives. By the way, the whole thing's a cemetery. Whole thing, Jewish cemetery. And they, they're putting the, the, the rebuilt altar right there. There's a, there's a rabbi that owns the land. I've done my due diligence. I know what's about to happen. I know what's about to happen. But did you know on the Jerusalem side, you see what separates Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives is the Kidron Valley which run into what we call the Valley of Gehenna, the Valley of Hinoim. And I learned some great things about that. But nonetheless, you can tell I'm full. Woo. But I'm going to say, I told my wife, we stand on top of Herod's palace. We looked, I said, you see that hill of that little grassy spot? I said, Jesus going to put his foot down right there. He's going to walk down past the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to cross the Kidron Valley. And you know what the Muslims did on the Jerusalem side? They built a cemetery outside the walls of Jerusalem. Built a whole cemetery. And then years ago, bricked up the eastern gate. You know, Nehemiah rebuilt the gate. So about fish gate and this gate and Jaffa gate and all, all these gates. Well, one of them's completely dammed up. I mean, it don't even have to have a lock on it. I mean, it's nothing but concrete limestone. They, you can see the arches. They dammed the whole thing up. And I told my wife, I said, <laughs> that silly little Muslim cemetery thinks they're going to keep Jesus, the high priest, from showing up doing what he's supposed to do. His feet's going to hit the Mount of Olives. He's going to walk down past the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to come across the Kidron Valley. He's going to walk up through them bunch of dead Muslims in them tombs. He's going to kick open the eastern wall. He's going to walk in with a rod of iron. He's going to rule and reign. And I don't know about you, but it's coming to a town near you. You better be ready because we're going to reign with him, church. We're going to reign with him. I seen where it's going to happen. I watched it with my eyes. We drive down the road. He said, hey, that's Mount Carmel. I'm like, whoo, I'm about to have a come apart. That's Samaria. Oh, see that house over there? That's where John the Baptist in a dungeon got his head cut off. It was like, it was like living in a comic book. For the first time, uh, Joseph Z ever prophesied over my wife. He said, you know what I see about you? He said, your life's like an infomercial. This, 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 this. Oh, but wait, there's more. This, 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 this. Oh, but wait, there's more. Sham wow. Oh, but wait, there's more. So like every moment of the day, I was like, oh, wait, there's more. Woo. Oh, wait, there's more. Oh, wait, there's more. She took her socks and shoes off and got out in the Galilee water and started picking up rocks. He said, you know what's significant about this spot? I said, what's that? He said, this is where Jesus looked at Peter and said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And I'm sitting there thinking, whoo, I love him a whole lot more after I learned that. It was fantastical. But I've seen the results of the power of his resurrection. I've seen the historical ramifications for what will be fulfilled prophecy. Every bit of it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't know. Next month during their specific time of Passover... I don't know what the priests are going to do. I don't know what Islam's going to do because now we found out that October 
if you watch the news at all, we found out that the Islamic terrorists, Hamas, went on a news conference. They always cover their face because that's what cowards do. Or people that believe in COVID. But uh, nonetheless... Anyhow, nonetheless, I digress. But he said one of the reasons they were attacked, one of the biggest reasons is in a disrespectful way, they said, we had to kill the superstition of the red cow nonsense in Israel. You know why? Because every Muslim knows the prophecy of the third temple. And they know exactly where it has to go. So he says, well, don't you know what that's going to cause internationally? Don't you realize that America and the UN right now have turned their backs on Israel already? So don't tell me about international peace, peace treaties. Don't, don't come at me with this. Well, you know what we need is a two-state solution. You know what two-state solution means? It means give it all to them and Israel will be destroyed. There's no two-state solution. It all belongs to Israel. Every last drop of it. Somebody says, well, you know, can, can, can you show me like the, the legal rights to the land? Yeah, I sure can. They're right here in the Bible. Right here in the Bible. So all of that to say, I, I don't know what's going to happen next month. Who knows? If, if, if that preacher calls me and says, hey, it's happening. You know me, I might, I might take a load and go watch it. I don't know. I'll be there the night it happens. I, I'll be a part of history and be a part of prophecy. I don't care. You see, I ain't, I ain't for sale. I ain't playing games with people no more. I've done seen where his foot's going to touch down. I've done seen it. I've seen the valley he's going to walk through. I've seen the doors he's going to kick open. I've seen where he's going to sit. Toured the city of David underground. In the hidden, carved out tunnels of Hezekiah. Walking in places that sometimes tourism can't take you. Climb down under Jerusalem. Way, 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 way down. He said, you, you see how far down that was? I said, yeah. He said, they used to ride mules down here. That's how they get them in here. I was like, oh, that's interesting. But let me tell you what was really interesting. I'm preaching. We got to a certain spot where the Gihon River was whoo, just a flowing in the ground. He said, read this. And David said to Zadok the priest, put my son Solomon on a donkey. Take him down to the Gihon Spring and anoint him there as the king of Israel. And when I stood in a spot where Zadok the priest anointed Solomon to be the wisest and richest king that the nation of Israel and Jerusalem ever know. I'm telling you, I like to have a Holy Ghost come apart in front of the tour guide. I'm telling you, goose pimples so big. I mean, just popping up all over me. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing. We'd, we'd go places. He'd say things. I'd be like, you got to be kidding me. Show me how they conquered the land. Show me how they came in. And the Jebusites stood on the wall and said, David, you can't come in. Jebusites, that was the place of Jerusalem. He overtook the place that was already built. He said, this is a nice fortress, God. I want you to give it to me. You can't get in. You can't get in. You can't get in. You can't climb up the wall. David said, you're right. You ought to see the tunnel they swam through. You talk about David's mighty men. Make most of our people, even in the military, look like sissies. Swim through five, ten feet of water in a cave with no lights. Just to swim up, got your sword, got your shield. Swim up in there and take care of them Jebusites turning into the city of Jerusalem. Man, I'm telling you, it was crazy standing there watching all that. And when I got on that plane, the Lord said, not only will you never be the same again, but you listen to me, you better mash the gas more than you've ever mashed it. You better preach harder than you've ever preached. You better pray more than you've ever prayed. You better read longer and read more than you've ever read. You better fast. You better preach, son. You better preach. I ain't got no time to back up and mess around. This stuff's happening. Stuff's happening. We used to hear all the time, well, you know, it's one day it's all going to line up. Well, what you going to do when you hear the fact that it's all lined up right now? It's all lined up right now. 
I don't know what the next six months looks like. I'll let God take care of it. I don't know what the next year looks like. I'll let God take care of it. I don't know what the next 10 years looks like. I'll let God take care of it. But I'm telling you right now, if you think you've got another 50, you're smoking a pipe. Let that sink in. Oh, I'm so burdened for my family. Really? It's about to go down. You better tell them about Jesus right now. Quit waiting. Quit waiting. Well, I'll invite them at Christmas. I'll invite them next Resurrection Sunday. Why don't you invite them Wednesday? Why don't you invite them next Sunday? Why don't you get them under the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ? This thing's happening. This whole thing's gearing up. It's gearing up. I saw it. I can't be the same. I, I feel like I'd be a blasphemer if I came home the same. To deny what my eyes beheld. To see a nation, as Paul said, zealous. They got zeal without knowledge. Walking around reading the Bible every day. Tassels. Locks of hair. Hats. Yarmulkes. Tradition this, tradition that. Shabbat happens, whole place shuts down. I was drinking cappuccino every day. Shabbat happened, they said, we don't make cappuccino on Shabbat. Excuse me? <laughs> I'm down in the hotel. I was like, I'd like to have a cappuccino. They said, no, no, no. There's Nescafe in there. You can go make your own, but we don't make cappuccino on Shabbat. I'm like, what? You can't even order a cheeseburger. They, they don't mix dairy and meat. I, I'm telling you, it's like crazy stuff. And I'm like, these people are intense. Even in what we would consider foolishness. And no doubt some of it is because it's been fulfilled. And we look at that and we're like, man, these people are intense. And I'm like, yeah, I can't even get our crowd to read the Bible. Right? We're driving down the road. Lord, don't let a drunk hit me. Lord, you know, just don't let me get mad at the next red light. That's like the consistency of our prayer. I'm at the wailing wall at 630 in the morning with people that are 18 to 30 years old. Like young people rocking up against the wall. <laughs> we come sure somebody waves their hand, says amen too loud, or waves the flag, and we start getting nervous. I could hear them coming down the streets of Jerusalem. I'm like, well, I'm getting close to the wall. You could hear them. <laughs> hear them wailing. They call it a wailing wall for a reason. I didn't even know why the Wailing Wall was there. I mean, it's not, it's not a biblical situation. You know why the Wailing Wall is there? It's the only wall they can get to that's still attached to the Temple Mount that the Muslims ain't took. It's as close as they can get to the Temple. It's as close as the Jews can get to the glory of God in their mindset. You get Jesus, you get Yeshua, you can get as close as you want to. We know that. They don't. And those blessed people standing outside of a wall trying to get the glory of God. I've been preaching on it for a month and some of you still ain't figured it out yet. And you ain't got to have a wall. You ain't got to have a tent. We ain't got to have an Ark of the Covenant. I got one in my office, praise God, if you want to see it. I don't have to have any of it. We may boldly enter in. Boldly enter in. Am I helping somebody? I know some of you are like, oh my goodness, he didn't get to the text yet. And I may not. Don't worry about it. You know, I used to hear all the time, and I've said this a thousand times. This is one of the things that just kind of got my, my head thinking. We're looking over Jerusalem. We're looking at what is now the, the Temple Mount, what is the, the Dome of the Rock. But we begin to see models, and the, the guy's like, let me show you this and this. There was this wall. It looked like a, it looked like a road barrier, like a concrete road barrier down the highway, right? Of course, Tennessee's always got some highway road, road barriers, praise God. It's like the state flower. <laughs> road barriers. So he said, let me point this out to you. He said, you see that wall right there? So we go to the Israeli museum, which most people don't go to, and they had fragments, remains of that, of that wall. And I was like, that's interesting. He said, you see that wall? He said, nobody ever talks about that wall. He said, you know Paul mentioned that wall. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said that he broke down the middle wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles. And I saw a barrier wall where years ago, if a Gentile would have crossed over the concrete barrier, they would have killed him on the spot. Because the temple was only for the Jews. The outer courtyard, as Jesus said, is where some of the Gentiles 
could come and bebop around if they so felt worthy to do so. And he said, see that wall? He said, when Paul said that Jesus broke down the middle wall of partition, he said, in your English mindset, American culture, you don't get it. He said, but in our mindset, what that did is it broke down the barrier between Jew and Gentile, and now both of us have full access to the glory and the presence of God. I always preached, we know the veil was rent. Yeah, the veil was rent. That was for us to get into the presence of God. But the stone wall was broke down so that Jews and Gentiles could come together in the same body of Christ. And I would have never made that correlation unless my eyes had beheld it for their wee little selves. I saw it broke down in my presence. It's all of that to say in Philippians 3. Paul said that I may know him. You, you can mark verse 10. I ain't going to go through all that I may know him. You see, I love you as your friend and shepherd enough to tell you something. Some of you know about him. But you don't know him. Now, I don't even mean from a standpoint of redemption. Some of you can know that you're saved, but not intimately know the one that saved you. I saw a sign in Nashville a couple years ago. I was stricken that I even saw it. I was like, wow, I can't believe somebody put that out. It said, and I quote, does Jesus know you're saved? That's a pretty good sign. Oh, I'm saved, I'm saved, I know Jesus. Yeah, does Jesus know you? And Paul said, here's my main goal in life, that I may know him, I want to intimately, passionately, romantically, in every way, authoritatively, I want to know God. Why? So we can make him known. And you can't make somebody known if you don't know them intimately. But what does that have to do with today? Everything. Because he says next, and the power. Shout power. power. Shout power. power. Shout power. power. And the power of his resurrection. Wait a minute. The same power that pulled Jesus out of a damp, dark tomb is the same power that defeats addictions in your life to this very day. Defeats demons and strongholds and temptations in your life to this very day. The same power that got Jesus out of a tomb is the same power that holds your marriage together in this tent. Same power. Same power. 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 He said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. He said, I want an empty tomb to affect me practically. See, historically we can talk about it. Prophetically we can talk about it. We, we, oh yeah, no, no, no. Practically, has the resurrection changed your life? If it hasn't, something's wrong. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Do we believe it? Do we believe it? It should change us. The fact that the same power that pulled Jesus out of a grave is the same power that has been placed within me, the dunamis power of God. Same power. And that's why God can say to the early church, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you won't sit around bored Twiddling your thumbs with nothing to do. No, no, no. You'll go out and be witnesses. You'll start right here in Jerusalem, and then you'll go out from there, and you'll change the entire region. You'll change the world. You'll change social media. You'll change your church. You'll change this campus. You'll change your marriage. You'll change your mind and change your heart and change your life about some stuff when the power comes upon you. And the same power that got Jesus out of a grave is the same power that we have in this tent. It's the glory of God. It's accessible to us now. Of his resurrection. Well, I just, I, just, I just can't stop whatever. The power of his resurrection to help you put that bottle down. The power 
of his resurrection will let you flush them pills down the toilet. The power of his resurrection can change everything about your home, everything about this campus, everything about this nation. The power of his resurrection. Now let me say this, because I've taught a lot and talked a lot. Not that I'm apologizing, I'm just saying. We like that aspect of the gospel. It's powerful, and we should. Okay, it's what sets other dead religious leaders apart. Okay, we get it. He died. He was buried. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. He rose from the dead. He's no longer dead anymore. Okay, we get that. Everybody wants the power of the resurrection without an afternoon of crucifixion. Everybody wants to be anointed without being spit on. Hmm? Everybody wants to be pat on the back. Nobody wants to get slapped in the face. Huh? Everybody wants an attaboy. Nobody wants to pray and, and sweat great drops of blood in a garden of an olive press. And say, not my will, but thine be done. Everybody wants the power of his resurrection nobody wants the next part of the verse the fellowship of his sufferings years ago I won't be too hard on myself I used to be a little naive in that verse I've since grown out of it and I would say things like this well you know the Bible says we have to fellowship with our suffering so what that means is just get up a little extra early on Monday morning and get you some coffee and you just sit down you just talk to your problems you just, talk, you just fellowship with your suffering that ain't what it means it means when you suffer, it's the greatest time and level of fellowship that you will ever have with the one that understands your suffering. Because he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He has a touch, a soft spot in his heart for infirmity, temptation, hardship. So we've said it a thousand times. Let's say it a thousand and one. Everybody wants the power. Nobody wants the process. Everybody wants the glory of resurrection morning without the humiliation of crucifixion afternoon. And by the way, I'm convinced. I love that uh, Brother DR said something about this. I think it was yesterday I saw it. I was like, mash a gas, brother. Go for it. People argue about dumb stuff. He's crucified on Wednesday. He's crucified on Friday. How do you get three days? Stop. He's alive. Get over your mathematical calculations of how it worked out. I don't have to explain it. By the way, they can explain it just fine and it makes a whole lot of sense. But in our little American mindset, we can't. We're so weak and cheap when it comes to the Bible. It's a shame that Orthodox Jews who do not even believe the Messiah know a thousand times more Bible than people that have been to Bible college and have preached for 50 years in the United States of America. And people that don't even believe the gospel yet... Individually, because individual Jews have to get saved the same way we do, or they all go to hell. But nationally, the hand of God's over them, and the whole nation one day will be born again during the tribulation. It's time of Jacob's trouble. The book says that. But it's shocking to me that there is not a one of us in this room, including myself, that would confidently be able to sit down and biblically from the Old Testament take on an Orthodox Jew that eats your lunch. Because they know all the stuff that we think's boring. They've memorized all the stuff you skipped over because you can't pronounce Chetalomar or Mayher Shalahashbaz or this one begat this one and this one. Let me tell you something. Sit down at a picnic table in the town where Jesus was born and let the man read to you this one had this one and this one was the son of this one and you can see him sitting at the table with you. It'll change your life. I'm telling you whether I go with you or not, I'll get you connection. I'd start saving up if I was you. It's a lifetime trip. I don't care if it's two days or two weeks. I'm telling you, you will never, ever, ever be able to be the same when you see the Bible through the lens of of the Jewish nation. And if that offends you, know this. Your Savior is Jewish. Your Bible is Jewish. Everything you have from God was given to you by a Jewish nation. Everything. All of it. 
And when I sat there and saw it, I began to understand, oh, the power is resurrection. But then Paul says, yeah, but you better buckle up and buckle in for the fellowship of his sufferings. Some of you have been praying for the power. That's okay. Pray for it. Pray for authority. But here's the problem. When God answers your prayer, you try to pray your way out of what God put you into to give you the power. Lord, give me power. Lord, give me power. God says, okay, let me crank the heat up. I didn't want that. Give me another way, Lord. And you short circuit and you circumvent and pull the rug out from under the grace of God in your life because you prayed for power, but when God gave you what was going to lead you to the power of the resurrection, you didn't want the fellowship of the sufferings because you just thought, I'm just going to get plugged in, get turned on, and I'm just going to be this great influencer. God's going to give me a, a great big huge page on Facebook or TikTok or Instagram or Twitter X or whatever. I, I'm going to be a massive influencer. I'm here to tell you influencers come and go and never do a thing, but authoritative believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ turn the world upside down like those ragtag redneck hillbilly fishermen did. And Jesus walked through his hometown, saw a man sitting at the receipt of customs. He said, hey, Levi, what are you doing working for the Roman government, taking up taxes? You do realize your name's Levi because you're the Levitical priesthood, preacher boy. Put your money down. Tear them receipts up. Follow me. Hey, James and John. Run over to your dad, kiss him in the face, and say, we're out. We're out. And I, like our God, used to think, oh, poor dad. Poor, pitiful dad. Those two sons of thunder went in there and said, sorry. This rabbi's calling us, and we hate to just drop all the work. We got to leave later. Oh, what am I going to do? No, 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 no. When you go over there, you recognize something real quick. That dad threw a party. He was like, what? Because you see, in a Jewish mindset, it's a rabbi that chooses you to follow them. And this miracle-working rabbi came walking through town and said, you two boys, don't ask any questions. Tell your daddy bye. We ride it down. And they said, shh, shh, well, by now. And daddy was like, whoo, my boys were picked by a rabbi. Hmm? Puts a whole new perspective on it when you sit in the spots where it happened. So we've gone a long way around the barn. We've done a little talk, talking, laughing, crying, teaching, preaching, a little amalgamation of the whole deal. This is the most shotgun sermon I've preached in a long time. Just let it spread, Lord, let it spread. Pellets all over the room. But I'll tell you this. Woe be unto us if we preach for a month and more than likely several months on the glory of God. And we want it. But woe be unto us when we're not willing to pay the price for it. So I pray deeply this morning that you desire the power and the authority of the resurrection. But I pray even more fervently and pastorally that you will submit to the fellowship of his suffering. Because when you are weak, he is strong. Most gladly, therefore, will I now glory in my infirmities, while that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Would you stand with me all over this room? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, everyone standing. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive us, Lord, for such a casual approach to the things of God. We all would grab this mic and rah, rah, bishkum, ba about the power, but we would be gloriously quiet about the process that leads us to the power. Lord, we don't have much time. There's people in this room right now that need to come to this altar and say, God, forgive me for wasting so much time. He's coming, folks. He's coming. God, forgive us for not being 
valuable witnesses to our family and friends and children. Forgive us, Lord, for not being faithful. Forgive us for pretending like we understand things when we live in such biblical arrogance and ignorance. God, forgive us. God, forgive us. God, forgive us. Fill these steps today with hungry hearts of men and women and young people, young men, young ladies, children even, that say, God, I'll pay what price I have to pay. I'll say what needs to be said. I'll not be like the culture. I'm not trying to fit in. I'm trying to stand out for the sake of the kingdom. Some of you need to come and repent and say, God, forgive me for complaining about the sufferings. Help me to embrace them so I can experience the power of his resurrection in my life. Forgive us, Lord, for being quiet and silent and timid and gospel shy. Forgive us for not being courageous. Not walking in the gifts of the glory of God. Lord, today, may people fall on their face and say, Holy Spirit, completely, absolutely baptize me in your presence. Give me the fire power of God in my life, and in doing so, I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. God, forgive us for our timidity. Forgive us for our lack of commitment to the things of God. And oh, Father, today, as your word begs us, we pray for the peace of God's people in Israel, Lord. We cannot turn our backs on them. Oh, God, there's such a blessing upon a church that will walk in that. There's a blessing on a marriage that will walk in that. There's a blessing on a nation that will walk in that. And God, don't let us stray farther than we've already strayed in turning our back on the people of God. God, forgive us as a nation. We repent. God, we repent. We repent. We repent. So right now, all over this room, many people have begun to come. I want you to slip out right now and say, oh, God, look, I do want the glory. Yes, God, I do want the power. But I promise, Lord, I'll be willing to crawl on that cross. I'll be willing to die to myself every day. I'll be willing to have some friends and family walk out of my life if need be. I'll be willing. I'll be willing. I'll be faithful to the things of God. I'll be a faithful servant of the kingdom. I'll be a faithful servant of the church of the living God. No more lackadaisical. No more lukewarm. No more half-hearted. No more little bit in and all the way out. Oh, no, fully in, fully engulfed in the things of God. Drench me in your power and presence, Lord. Give me a holy courage, a holy boldness. Some of you need to come today, pray for your family. Pray for your family. You see, you, you're not going to think when the news story breaks in the next few weeks or months when it, when it breaks this year and they say oh my goodness it has begun you're going to think to yourself why am I not being urgent you see the message of the gospel is urgency urgency your kids need urgency your marriage needs urgency teenagers young adults gen z you need urgency and you have it far more than we in my generation could ever imagine come on come on right now all over the room all over the room miss billy and our crew is over there at the baptismal if you today are going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, then just begin to leave your seat. If you're praying, take your time, but just begin to leave your seat. We've got little changing rooms. If you have never followed the Lord in water baptism, today is your day. Not next week, not next Easter. No, right now, today is your day. Young and old alike. I'm going to preach on it probably next week when we talk a little bit more about the day of Pentecost. I never understood until I stood on that spot. I never understood how they successfully baptized 3,000 converts at the same time until I went there and I stood and I saw it for myself. It makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. First thing you ought to do after you repent and believe the gospel is get water baptized. It's what the Bible teaches. You start getting ready. We'll get your towels. We'll get you lined up. We'll get your name tag. We'll get you in the line and we'll see you baptized in the name of the Lord. But you come. You come all over this room. You come. 
If you need extra prayer today, if you're not even at this altar, but you need extra prayer, you get down here right now. We'll have one of our prayer members and deliverance team lay hands on you. We will pray for you. If you need healing today, come on. If you need deliverance today, right now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we come against every spirit of witchcraft that would be over this tent right now. In Jesus' mighty name, we come against it right now. Every religious spirit, in the name of Jesus, we command you to come off the people of God right now. We command it. We command it in Jesus' mighty name. Spirits of infirmity, spirits of cancer, we rebuke you in the mighty name of Jesus. Spirits of unforgiveness, we call you forth right now. and We say you must come out of every man. You must come out of every woman. We speak life over you today in the mighty name of Jesus. You need help. You need prayer. Slip your hand up. We'll get to you right now. We'll get to you right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need some team members. Get on up here. Come on right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you've never been saved, you need to repent, sir. You need to repent, ma'am. Right now, you need to call on the name of the Lord and say, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Change me, Jesus. I accept you today as my Savior, as my Messiah. I receive you today. Save me, Jesus. I'm a sinner. Save me, Jesus. I submit to you. Do that. Do that. You need help? Come on down here. We'll pray with you. Receive him today. Receive him today. Be cleansed today. Be healed today. Be saved today. Be baptized today. Be delivered today. Be set free today. Be at peace and joy today, church. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Take as long as you need. Keep coming. Keep praying. Begin to line up for our baptismal celebrations, young and old alike. We'll baptize every person wanting to follow the Lord in water baptism today. We do not ever have an official dismissal at Global Vision, so you can remain for the baptisms. Our team's going to begin to worship. Men, in the morning, we still will be on track. 6 a.m., right here in the hospitality room, Bible study. We're in the book of Exodus. Six o'clock in the morning, men, we will be meeting together. All right? I know I'm a little jet lagged and stuff. That's all right. I believe it's important. I don't want to miss it. Six o'clock in the morning, men, pack that room out like you have been. Let's put chairs out. Standing room only. Get here. Let's get serious. Time short. Time short. Time short. Get here in the morning. Six o'clock. We're going to meet together. You get around. You love each other. You fellowship one with another. We never say you're dismissed. We just say, we'll see you again. We'll see you men in the morning. We'll see everyone else on Wednesday night. Next week, we want you back. We want you back. We want you back. We'd love to have you here at our church. If you don't come to our church, go to a church. Get faithful. Time's short. Quit messing around. You can't burn the candle of life at both ends and blow the smoke in God's face. You'll not be mocked. Let this be a a moment when the light bulb comes on and you say, wow, wow, my life's changed. My life's changed. I'm going to be faithful to church. I'm going to read the Word of God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to tell my co-workers about Jesus. There's going to come a time that the news media is going to tell you what I said is going to happen and you're going to feel ashamed because you've done nothing with it. You've done nothing with it. So just keep getting prayer. Get in line for baptismal celebrations. All of our folks online, our hub leaders, just begin to minister right now in those church buildings and those office complexes and those living rooms right now. Just begin to minister. Just begin to minister. Let the glory of God fill this place. Let the power of His resurrection fill this place. If you're glad you came to church today, give God some praise in His house right now on this Resurrection Sunday. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Get what you came for. Get what you came for today. Let's worship Him.
tonight, Sister Bonnie, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel. It gives me a great honor to baptize you today. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, bear to baptism. Praise the walk in Hennessy Lie. Hallelujah. Glory, public confession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel. It gives me a great honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very baptism. Praise the walk and it is alive. my young sister of the Lord upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ your obedience to follow him gives me a great honor to baptize you in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit bear to baptism raise to walk in the innocent life of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power and glory of his gospel. It gives me a great honor to baptize you today before these witnesses in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Praise the walk and lead us alive. you be upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel. It gives me a great honor before these witnesses today to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Praise to walk in this life. According to your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, the power of his gospel, it gives me a great honor, sir, to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Raise to walk in newness of life. your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel. It gives me a great honor before these witnesses, sir, to baptize you today in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear in baptism. Praise to walk in newness of life. public confession of faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel. It gives me a great honor, ma'am, to baptize you today before these witnesses in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Praise to walk in newness of life. Jacob, upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the power and glory of his gospel, it gives me a great honor, sir, before these witnesses today to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life.
Sister Cordelia, according to your public profession of faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power and glory of his gospel, it gives me a great honor to baptize you today, ma'am, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, married in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Levi, my young brother in the Lord, according to your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, the power of his gospel, gives me a great honor, sir, to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Praise to walk in the life. Brother in the Lord, upon your public confession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel, it gives me a great honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Praise to walk in this life. And never, and never, hallelujah, hallelujah, and never. My young brother in the Lord, upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of his gospel, gives me a great honor, sir, to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, buried in baptism. Praise to walk in newness of life. Hallelujah. Jacob, upon your public confession of faith in Jesus Christ, the power and glory of his gospel, gives me a great honor, sir, to baptize you today in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Grace to walk in this life. Sister Kelly, upon your public confession of faith in Jesus Christ, the power of his gospel, gives me a great honor before these witnesses today to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Raise to walk in newness of life. Amy, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel, it gives me a great honor today before these witnesses to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in baptism. Raise the walk in newness of life. Brother Brandon, upon your public confession of faith in Jesus Christ, the power of his gospel, and your obedience to follow him, gives me a great honor to baptize you, sir, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Praise to walk in the She, she got the uh, fire department here this morning. Amen. <laughs> All right, Sister Belinda, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, the power and glory of his gospel, it gives me a great honor to baptize you, ma'am. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, bear to baptism. Raise to walk in newness of life.
Yes, you are.